So you finish your song and you take it out to listen to it in the car or on your headphones and you realize, oh man, this doesn't sound good. Why doesn't it sound good? Well, I have good news for you. It is not GarageBand's fault and it's likely not even your fault. It's actually just not having a system to follow when you're going through the mixing process. So in today's video, I wanna walk through the four goals that all pros follow when they're mixing and the six steps that you can use to accomplish them inside GarageBand. Let's get into it. Welcome back to the Band Guide, where we use GarageBand to create professional sounding music. I'm your band guy, Colin, and today we're talking about how to mix like a pro. This is another video in the Ultimate GarageBand Beginner's Guide series where we're walking through everything from the first time you open up GarageBand until you export your final mixed and mastered song. In fact, we just finished recording a song together and we're about to mix and master it together, so come back for that. If you haven't already seen the other videos, definitely go back and check those out as well. And before we get into today's video, I also have something I want to give you. I've put together the Ultimate GarageBand Guide. This guide walks through recording, mixing, mastering, shortcuts, gear you need, really everything, and it's completely free from link in the description below. It also goes a little bit more in depth into some of the things that we're talking about in this video, so it can really help you out with that as well. And you can just quickly reference it anytime you're working on your mix. You can go to the mixing section, just find how do I do compression? How do I do EQ? It's got all of that in it. So be sure to grab it, but let's go and get into today's video where we're talking about how to mix like a pro in GarageBand. Now, as I mentioned at the top of this video, there are four goals that all pro engineers have when they're working on a mix. They're focusing on balancing and highlighting their volumes, their frequencies, their dynamics, and their space. So volumes like your volume, frequencies like your bass, mids, and treble on your car stereo, dynamics like how loud and how quiet it is, making sure that's never too loud or never too quiet, and then their space, creating a realistic space so your song gels together and feels like it's realistic and not just some weird computer recording, right? Now, you may be thinking, okay, that's great, but how do I accomplish those four goals? Well, you can accomplish them just by walking through the six steps that we're about to go through together in this video. You don't need to think about those goals too much as much as just focus on going through those steps, knowing that you're working through those goals. So these six steps are step one, the static mix, step two, master track process, step three, EQ on individual channels, step four, compression on individual channels, step five, effects like reverb and delay, and step six, automation. Let's go and break those down a little bit more, starting with step one, the static mix. So the static mix is where we are mixing with only volume and pan. We are not focusing on any plugins at all in this stage. We are just getting our volumes perfectly dialed in. If you don't get your volumes right, your mix will never be right. Volume is absolutely the biggest thing in a mix. So you gotta get your volume position set properly. Now, to do this, you need to take off all your plugins on your mix. So if you've added reverb or delay or other effects or EQ or compression and started to kind of mix it, take those off and focus on just getting your volume set properly. Once you have all your volume set properly, it's gonna be way easier to make decisions for effects and EQ and compression, all that stuff. So start without any of those on. And to be clear, leave your GarageBand amp designer and things like that on that are creating the sound, but take off anything that was kind of mixing that you might have already done. And especially take off any sort of reverb and delay. Last caveat is that I do typically leave like reverb that I would have had on an amp in the amp designer on because that's like if I'd mic'd it up in a real room, that's already in the recording. So anything like that, that's part of the sound, leave it on. But if you've added reverb with the, any of the sliders or with a reverb plugin, take all that stuff off. Okay, so once you've set that up, take all your volumes down to zero, and then I have a couple tips for you. First, you wanna download MV Meter 2 by TB Pro Audio and put it as the last plugin on your master track. Open this up and set it to peak standard, and then you're gonna keep it up the entire time that you're setting your volumes, and you wanna make sure that you never go past negative six to negative three. Now, the reason that we do this is because you need to keep headroom at the top of your mix. So your computer has a point called digital zero that after that point, it just, it doesn't know what to do with the sound and it just cuts it off. It just says, I don't know what to do with this, so I'm not gonna do anything with it. And you lose that and it digitally distorts and that sounds bad. And so what you need to do is mix below digital zero. And by having this peak standard meter up, we can see that we're staying safely below digital zero. So by keeping 
negative six and negative three, somewhere in that range, definitely never over negative three on your static mix, then you know you have headroom that's clean and you don't have to worry about this digital distortion. So one more tip with this, don't worry too much about it. If you start to get close, just throw a gain plugin as the first plugin on your master track and you can turn it down a little bit. But don't try to just pull it way down after you didn't pay attention to setting your volumes. Set all your volumes and if you start to see that you get close to digital zero, add a gain plugin and just turn down a little bit. Okay, tip number two is to take advantage of wide panning. Now, if you want your mix to sound big and wide, you have to have some things panned all the way off to the left or all the way off to the right. I guess it would be left for you, right for you. It's backwards because of the camera. Okay, so you have to have some things panned really wide if you want your mix to sound and feel big and wide. Now, you wanna pay attention to the balance and make sure that's not leaning off to one side but have some things that are panned far left and right. In that guide, I actually have a little sheet that will give you some tips for this as well, so check that out. But let's go and move on to step two, which is master track processing. Now, master track processing, we're just trying to jumpstart our mix. This is where your entire mix runs together in one place. So by doing a little bit of processing here, we can jumpstart our mix and make it sound way more professional before we even start doing anything on individual tracks. So we only have two plugins that we're gonna use here and try to accomplish two goals. We're gonna start with EQ, and with EQ, we're just focusing primarily on the low end, the bass information where it feels right in the low end, and then the high end, right? And you just wanna be listening and determining what moves you might wanna do with this. So for example, if your mix feels a little bit harsh, maybe do just a little bit of a cut on the high end, and that's gonna help your mix feel a little more rounded. If your mix feels really weak and thin, maybe a little bit of a boost in the low end is gonna help your mix feel a little bit fuller, right? Or vice versa, if it feels a little bit overwhelming in the low end, just dial that back just a little bit, and your mix before before you even get into mixing on individual tracks is going to be closer to the end product. Plus, this is going to save you a lot of time because let's say your mix needs to be a little bit brighter. If you add a little bit of brightness on the master track, that's going to save you from having to go on to each individual track and adding brightness on each individual track. And so a little bit of processing on your master track can really, really help out with EQ. With this, you only want to be doing maybe up to three decibel boosts or cuts, right? Not big moves. If you're going six, seven, eight decibels, that is too much. It's never gonna sound realistic or natural. So very, very subtle, very slight moves here, but you'll be amazed at what it can do. In our video, in just a couple days, we're gonna be looking at this together in our song. So come back for that. And then our second tool that we wanna use is compression. Now compression is gonna help glue our mix together. It's just containing the dynamics a little bit, which is gonna make it feel a little bit more cohesive as opposed to just a bunch of disjointed tracks, right? So my biggest recommendation here is download Buster SE by Analog Obsession. This is a free compressor and it is amazing. It is currently my favorite bus compressor. Analog Obsession is completely free, but if you do have the means, definitely do support them. It's all on their Patreon page and there is a way for you to support them right there. But if you go to their link, they'll link to below, you'll see at the bottom of the posting, they have download links for free. They want them to be free, but if you have the means, definitely do support them. They're a great company. They have a bunch of really good plugins. We'll be talking about those more in upcoming videos as well. Okay, so once you've dialed in EQ and compression on your master track, you're gonna be amazed at how much cleaner and fuller it sounds already. But now it's time to start diving into individual tracks with step number three, EQ. EQ is maybe the most powerful tool that you have in GarageBand. This is how you shape the tone of your song. If you want your kick to cut through in the mix more, you're gonna do that with EQ. If you want your vocals to have more presence, you're gonna do that with EQ. If you want your bass to have way more low end, you're gonna do that with EQ. EQ is the tool to get your mix sounding right. And it may look intimidating on face value, but there's really only two things you can do with EQ. You can cut or you can boost. So you can either reduce or remove things or you can add more of them. That's really it. Just like on your car stereo, when you have bass, mids, and treble, you can either turn them up or turn them down. That's all you're doing. Now, you break this out across six zones and each of those zones sounds very, very different. So you have sub information at the very bottom of an EQ. That sounds like kind of like how you feel it hitting your chest, that's way down there. You have bass, that's where it's really full sounding. You have low mids, that's again where it can be really full sounding, it's also starting to sound warm. You have mids, this is where it can sound boxy or it can really be the body of the source. You have upper mids where you're starting to get into more presence and then you have brightness, right? Each of these zones sounds very, very different. Not every source even has every zone. So you gotta get familiar with an EQ, 
but they're not actually that hard to use. So I'll link to a video above here where I talk about the only two moves you can do with an EQ, and I break down those zones a little bit more and show you how I actually go through the EQ process in a song. And then we're also gonna be EQing a song together in this series coming up here in just a few days. So again, come back for that. And be sure to grab the guide because it has a little bit more helpful information and a literal cheat sheet for EQ that you can check out. Now with EQ, I have two tips for you. Tip one, if you struggle to hear EQ, boost like crazy. I mean, like as high as it will go and move around and get familiar with what it sounds like at those different points, that's gonna help you hear it. And then scale it back to a more reasonable amount, which is tip number two, which is that most of your EQ moves are likely gonna be somewhere between four to six decibels. You can go a little bit less, you can go a little bit more. Occasionally I'll do 15 decibels, nine decibels, 10 decibels, if I need to, but you always wanna be thinking as little as you can, but as much as you need to. So don't limit yourself to only ever doing three decibels, four decibels, anything like that. Do as much as you need to, but as little as you can. So most of your moves will likely be around four to six decibels, but if you need to do more, do more. Okay, that takes us to step number four, which is compression. Now, compression is where we're containing the dynamics of our song. We can add punch, add presence, add sustain, and contain the dynamics with compression. This is a really, really powerful tool because if you want your mix to feel impactful and full, compression is really gonna be what's doing that. So, for example, on a vocal, vocals are very dynamic. Some words are way louder than other words. And so, by using a compressor to turn it down on the louder words, and turn up the quieter words, you can make everything just feel more consistent. It's gonna make those vocals feel more upfront and more present. Or with something like a kick drum, you can have the compressor turn down right after the hit, and that's gonna make that hit feel more impactful, right? Or something like a bass guitar, you could have it turn down on the loud part of a, a sustained note, you know, note hits like this and falls off. We'll have it turn down that quieter part and then slowly let volume back up, and you're gonna hear more of the sustain of that bass. So, that guide has a lot of helpful information in how to set a compressor. I've also done an in-depth tutorial to using compression that I'll link to above here, and we're gonna apply compression in our song coming up in the series, so also come back for that. Compression is a really powerful tool. It looks a little confusing on face value, but again, I absolutely know that you can understand it and start using it in your mixes. At the end of the day, you really only have to learn EQ and compression. That's it. Everything else is more just what do you like, like the next step that we're going to talk about, which is step five, effects. Here we're talking about reverb and delay. That's the only two effects you really need to learn and use, and there's nothing that you necessarily have to learn about them. You just have to figure out what you like with them. With a reverb and delay, it's just going through presets and maybe tweaking them a little bit, but there's nothing really technical about them. So a reverb is that sound if you walk into a huge room and you hear your voice just kind of floating around in the room. That's reverb. A delay is if you go to the Grand Canyon and you shout and you hear your voice come back to you. So it's like delay, 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 delay. like hey, like hey, like hey. Right? Okay, so that's a delay. And using these two effects, you can create very realistic or very interesting spaces in your song. Now, my biggest tip with effects is that less is more. If you do too much effects, you're gonna cloud your mix. You could have a great sounding mix up to this point, and then if you dial in too much of the effects, it's just gonna to start to sound cloudy and muddy and really no good. So you wanna do as little as you can, as much as you need to, but really as little as you can. I like to think of effects as being better felt than heard, so you should be just kinda of dialing them in until you're feeling them. So I tend to focus on a couple of key elements like my snare drum and my vocal that have kinda of my primary effects on them, and then other than that, I'm doing really really, really subtle effects on other sources. Okay, so that is step five, effects. Again, the guide goes a little bit more in depth, so be sure to grab the guide. And let's go and talk about step six, which is automation. Now, this is when you're finishing your mix. This is just fine tuning it, tweaking it that last little five, 10%, making sure that everything's the exact right volume, pan position, and that nothing's ever too loud or too quiet. And you can use this to add a little bit of interest. So if you want an effect to just come up for one second and be like way too loud, and it's like, whoa, what was that? You can do that with automation. So automation, it used to be that in a pro studio with like an analog console, you'd have to be manually moving the faders. You might have to have an intern or a couple of interns come in and turn knobs and move faders for you to get things at the right volumes in the mix while it's printing to tape. So you gotta get it right. With GarageBand, you can do all this. You can have a billion little interns running around inside GarageBand moving things up and down for you at the exact right moment. And if you don't get it right, instead of ruining a whole tape, now you can just tweak it again and get it right. So with automation, 
it's infinitely variable. You can automate just about anything, but there's really three things that I would encourage you to focus on when you're starting out. Your lead vocal volume. So after you've set your compression, are there still occasionally words that you can't hear quite as well or a phrase that might be a little bit too loud? Using a little bit of vocal automation on the volume can really help it just sit at the exact right volume. That's called vocal writing. And then the second is your pan position. So maybe you have something pan across in this point in the mix just to make it more interesting. Or maybe you bring your guitars a little bit narrower in the verses and wider in the choruses so the choruses feel wider, right? Comparison is how you actually hear things. So if they get narrower for a second then wider, you'll notice when they're wider. And then finally, the third is your effects. So if you want to bring your reverbs way up in the chorus so it feels big and anthemic and then maybe down in the verses so it feels a little bit tighter like you're in a room with the singer, play around with those effects and dial them up and down at different points in the song. Okay, so those are the three volume writing, pan automation, and effect automation. And that's it. You've now mixed your song like a pro. Now, mixing is not where we're going to make our song loud. This is really important to understand. Your mix is going to be quiet. That is the nature of the beast with mixing. Mastering is where we're actually going to make your song loud. So in a couple videos, we're going to get into mastering together. So come back for that. I've also done a full video on mastering that I'll link to above right here. But mastering is the process of making it loud. When you're mixing, you're just trying to get it all to gel together in the mix. But if you want to take it out and listen to your car really quickly, you're on your headphones or your Sonos or your Bluetooth speaker, whatever, then you're probably going to want to turn up the volume a little bit. And we're going to do that with something called a limiter. So a limiter plugin, you just put it as the last plugin on your master track. You set the output to negative one, and then you just pull out the gain until it's loud enough. This is typically going to be somewhere between six and maybe 12 decibels, but use your ears. If it starts to sound like it's squashing or just sounding weird, then you probably need to dial it back a little bit. And we'll fine tune actually bringing up the volume when we go to mastering. So don't think of this as being your final master. Just get it loud enough so you can go listen to it on those other sources without turning your volume all the way up on them. Okay, so that's it. That's mixing in GarageBand. If you do all those steps, if you follow them and work through them and get familiar with them, every time you do it, you'll get better and your mixes are going to sound more and more professional. Professional. Okay, be sure to grab the Ultimate GarageBand Guide from the link in the description below. It's really going to help you out. And as always, I'd love to hear from you. Have you been doing all these steps in the mixing process? If not, which ones have you been missing? Let me know in the comments below. If this video is helpful, be sure to like, comment, subscribe, and I'll see you tomorrow with another video. One thing at a time.